Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about CRISPR today and gene editing. Um, and let's see if my advancer is going to work. Turn the power on. All right, so... Cell. And going to make the kinds of changes that can change the well a cell might build itself and really eventually change the way that we think about what makes us human or what makes a plan a plan and how we can change the genetic code for some kinds of desired outcomes. And this is a power that I think since the 1950s when we first had the structures of the DNA double helix and knew that this is the information carrier of the cell, I think researchers have been on this quest to understand what does the genome tell us about ourselves and how can we use that understanding to try to treat and cure disease in a fundamentally different way. And I think now with CRISPR, we're really on the threshold of kind of a new way of thinking about disease. So as a scientist, I can tell you CRISPR is kind of really revolutioned the way, the way that biologists study biology today. Um, there's been numerous journal articles and covers that have kind of featured CRISPR. If you look into the private industry world of biotech, startup biotech, big pharma, CRISPR is really on everyone's um, window right now because I think this is changing the way that we can, can treat and study disease. But then also I think you're going to see CRISPR popping up in some more mainstream magazines, even movies like Rampage. Did anyone here see Rampage this past year? Last year? No one? At least one? All right. So Rampage, that was actually where I took my lab as our first lab outing, and it's kind of a weird thing to have studied CRISPR at a time when no one in the world knew what it was, and then 10 years later, you're in a movie theater and The Rock is talking about CRISPR. <laughs> um, you guys probably didn't grow up with the X-Files like I did, but this was one of my favorite shows growing up, and there was another uh, season that they recently read, uh, did in 2016. CRISPR was all in the season finale, J-Lo was going to star in a CRISPR bioterror drama. So why is that? Well, I think there's a lot of possible opportunities with this new technology, but some ways that it could really change the world that we might not like or that might scare us. And so I think some of these big ethical discussions really go hand in hand with the new possibilities. And so I think towards the end of my talk, we'll get into that. And I should say, I would love to be interrupted with questions or comments throughout the talk. So please, if you want to contribute something or ask me or I'm being confusing, just raise your hand or shout out. And then of course we're going to get to the big news of last year. Who saw the news about CRISPR babies in 2018? So about half the room. So I think 2018 is going to go down in history as the first year that humans began modifying their genetic code in a permanent way that would be inherited by future generations. And if that kind of scares you, make you feel uncomfortable, I think it should. Um, but it's very real, and I think this is the new world we live in. There is this new capability. It's not going to go away. We're not going to stuff the genie back in the bottle. So I think there were a lot of issues and problems with what this particular researcher did. But the truth is we do now have a technology that can be combined with in vitro fertilization to install designer changes in the genome of a future child. And so now you think about the kinds of scenarios that got played out in sci-fi movies like Gattaca or any number of other books like Brave New World. I think we're kind of now reaching that point and it becomes critical to really think about the best way to use this technology. But I want to start with kind of deconstructing this word cloud and we're really going to begin with what is CRISPR? Where does the name actually come from? Where was this discovered? And how did it really turn into this new transformative technology? And for that, I want you to kind of keep two ideas separate in your mind. We're going to talk mostly about gene editing, which is this ability to rewrite DNA inside of cells. But CRISPR was not invented in a laboratory. It's not something that researchers made. It's actually something that we discovered in nature, in the world around us. Actually, all of you have bacteria growing on your skin, living in your gut, and those bacteria have CRISPR in them, naturally. So this is actually where we got the whole discovery of how bacteria use CRISPR and how an understanding of that basic pathway really enabled this entire new gene editing technology. So 
The first 15 minutes or so are going to be about this CRISPR biology story. How did we get here in the first place? And that's going to take us all the way back to 1987. This was one of those articles that probably very few people at the time read, but now 30 years later, this is kind of that seminal first discovery of this bizarre structure that we now call CRISPR. At the time, they just called it an unusual structure. And basically what they found is repeating sequences in the DNA of E. coli. So those of you that might do research in a laboratory here, E. coli is one of our favorite friends as a, a model organism because we can do genetics in it. We can use it as a factory to produce proteins or DNA for research. And these guys were basically sequencing a gene in E. coli. And what they found is at the three prime end of the gene, so if the gene's here, they looked just past it, and they found these bizarre repeats. And so they ended their paper just mentioning that the biological significance of those sequences wasn't known. And so for another 20 years, that was a big mystery. Why do bacteria have these stuttering sequences in their genome? So we can actually look at what a CRISPR looks like. Obviously, the DNA doesn't really look like this on a screen. But here we have all the A's, T's, G's, and C's from the genetic material from E. coli. And in highlighted in yellow now are those repeating sequences. So you can see they kind of are all in this beautiful periodic array. They're always spaced by the same amount. It's the same 30 letters repeating over and over again. And what was even more interesting is that by the 2000s, so this started as kind of an oddity in E. coli, by 2002, when the term CRISPR was coined, these were being found in every other bacterial genome you would investigate, they had a CRISPR. So it was widespread in nature, and they always had the same pattern where they were clustered, they had this regular spacing, they're relatively short sequences, and of course they're repeating. So that's where we actually get the term CRISPR from. But in those 15 or 20 years of sequencing new bacterial genomes and finding these repetitive arrays, there were still no clues as to what they're doing. But a lot of researchers figured if they're this widespread, they probably have some important function because generally over evolutionary timescales, things get preserved if they confer some selective advantage on an organism. And the first clues about what that advantage might be came from three papers in 2005 that essentially ignored the repeats and instead looked at the sequences spliced in between the repeats. And time and time again, they found that these sequences were often perfect matches to viruses. So that was the first indication that maybe CRISPRs have something to do with viral defense systems, something about bacteria interacting with virus. So how many of you guys know that bacteria get infected by viruses? So I think these, these are actual three, uh, not three, two-dimensional images of viruses in the course of infecting a bacterium. I think they're really bizarre but very cool life forms. They look kind of like a lunar spacecraft. Um, they basically have a little head where the DNA gets stored. That's kind of the, the genetic material. These tails with legs that latch onto the outer surface of the cell. And then they have pumps that inject the genetic material inside the cell. And these are extremely abundant on planet Earth. They number about 10 million trillion trillion. That's a million bacterial viruses for every grain of sand on the planet. If you scoop one little milliliter of seawater, there's about a billion viral particles in that droplet. So you should actually think of the ocean as being absolutely pervaded by viruses and bacteria. And there's this constant warfare going on where viruses are infecting cells and the cells have to counteract that threat with some combination of different immune systems. Just like we have our own immune systems that are constantly being bombarded with bacterial and viral pathogens, bacteria have this problem 10 times over. And so to protect against this eventual fate, if that infection is successful, where the cell literally explodes from the pressure of all these viruses copying themselves inside the cell, the idea in 2005 was that maybe this CRISPR thing is actually a new form of immunity 
that allows bacteria to defend themselves. By the way, I converted my talk to PowerPoint to use this computer. I would never use that dissolving animation if I were <laughs> usually presenting, so I just feel the need to tell you that that's, that's not me. So the theory then was maybe CRISPRs have something to do with viral immunity. And the kind of most elegant experiment, I think, in this field in these early days was a 2007 paper that was from a yogurt company. So why was a yogurt comp company studying CRISPR? Well, they were interested in this bacterium, Streptococcus thermophilus. So anytime you guys eat cheese or yogurt, you're eating Strep thermophilus. It's the main workhorse ingredient to ferment milk into dairy products. And that's like a 40 or $50 billion industry. So these companies that are growing massive bioreactors of fermenting milk, they really want to make sure they have the strains that are the hardiest and most robust so that they're not losing money on sick bacteria. So they took their strains. They knew their strains had these snippets of DNA that matched viruses. Then they intentionally infected those strains with viruses that had matching DNA. And lo and behold, they found that Okay, the animation's a little stuttered. They found that any time the strain had this little bit of DNA that had a match in a virus, that bacterium was completely immune to the infection. So that was the first proof that CRISPRs are providing immunity and that the CRISPRs really kind of like a vaccination card. The same way that you or your parents might keep track of, of vaccinations that a child receives at birth, and everyone should be vaccinated by the way, it's my public statement here. <laughs> Bacteria are vaccinating themselves too. They vaccinate themselves and they literally keep track of these vaccinations by storing snippets of the DNA from those invaders in their own genetic material. So they have a permanent copy that they can recall if they ever see this virus again. So think about that as being kind of parallel to the way that police officers or border security officials might use biometric identification like fingerprints or retinal scans, bacteria are using a different kind of recognition, the sequence of DNA. So then the question was, now we understand the genetics, that bacteria have these CRISPR sequences that they use for immunity. The next question is really, how does that work? What are the molecular components that are being deployed for this immune response? This was the focus of my PhD and the work of many others in the field. And I'm going to boil it down to kind of a very simple picture here, which represents CRISPR as a pair of molecular scissors. So essentially, these scissors have two important functions. First, they recognize that sequence of viral DNA with exquisite precision. And second, they introduce a cut in the DNA, which eventually triggers the rest of the viral genetic code getting destroyed. And the, this is kind of a more detailed view of this molecular machine. So this is kind of the star player in gene editing, and we're going to get back to gene editing in a sec. But essentially in gray is a three-dimensional image of Cas9, which is a weapon that actually does the cutting. And then in uh, black here is a molecule of RNA that serves as the GPS coordinates. So the way that DNA gets recognized is through base pairing between the guide RNA and the DNA. That gives you the accuracy, and then the break is made by the CRISPR-Cas9 enzyme. So in the context of an infection, imagine now you have a cell that's in the process of being attacked by a virus. The genetic material is up in the head, and here's the pump now injecting the DNA inside the cell. And at this point, the cell has about 15 minutes to destroy the DNA before the virus will destroy the bacterium. And so now the CRISPR-Cas9 machinery swings into action. The protein molecule, which is the cutter, and the guide RNA, which are the GPS coordinates. And this thing goes looking for any matching sequence that it might find inside the cell. It identifies that match using base pairing. And then the enzyme, the weapon, slices apart both strands, leading to the viral genome being destroyed. So this was roughly where we were in 2011. We understood what these systems are doing and why they're so broadly conserved, because they're allowing bacteria to win this warfare against virus. 
and we understand what the molecular components are that do the actual targeting and cutting. And that kind of led to this transformation of this uh, fusion point between the world of CRISPR and the world of gene editing. Because by this point, it was really clear that if you had a way to target a very specific sequence in the genome and introduce a break, then you could actually tap into what was by then a decades long journey to develop tools for gene editing in human cells, plant cells, and animal cells. So in 2012 then, the idea was we understand how CRISPR is used in a bacterial cell to cut and destroy viral DNA. Let's take some of those components out of bacteria, figure out how to make them work in a human cell so that now we can kind of make these precise changes to the genetic code anywhere that we might choose. Everyone with me so far? Any questions? Yes? Similar to deep fake detection, will there be a way to detect as far as if something's been done, whether it be offspring and such? Um, truthfully, you know, you could use, like, let's say, you'd have, to you'd have to compare the child to the parents, let's say, if we're talking about humans. Or this is a major question in agriculture, because right now, we're going to have a slide on what makes a GMO a GMO, and is a gene-edited crop genetically modified? And actually, how would you even know? Because the kinds of edits that we can make now with CRISPR, they don't have foreign DNA, where you're like, well, a gene from a bacterium should never be in a plant cell. But actually now you can make changes that don't look any different than the natural mutations that that plant might pick up sitting out in a field somewhere. So once you have the mutation, there's no real way to trace how it got there, aside from using comparative genetics to say, like, was it present in the kind of parents? But otherwise, no. So how would gene editing work using CRISPR? So I've shown you this cartoon. You've got, again, in a bacterial cell, the scissors. They're going to cut the DNA, and that break in the DNA leads to the viral genetic code being destroyed. But human cells actually have the ability to repair DNA breaks. So we actually are exposed to DNA damage all the time from sunlight, from other kinds of radiation, from carcinogens. Actually, every minute you pick up hundreds of thousands of DNA breaks in the many cells in your body. But we have dedicated pathways, biological pathways, in the cell that allows a break like this to be repaired in a way that we can actually bias as an experimentalist. So now imagine in a human cell, we're gonna use those same molecular scissors. We're gonna target a very specific sequence using those precision GPS coordinates. But now this broken DNA combined with a synthetic replacement template that we might use as a scientist, we're gonna coax the cell into taking this break and replacing the DNA with this replacement template. And so now imagine that in the context of disease, if you program the scissors to cut at the site of a genetic mutation, you could actually install the healthy copy of the gene simply by cutting and giving the cell the right sequence to repair that break with. So that was kind of the idea. It's very conceptual, like, like Joe introduced, to what you might do in a word processing software where you have a find term, a replace term, you can easily correct a typo that way. The idea was, can we use CRISPR to do the same type of error correction, but not on a, a Word document, which might be, I don't know how many words you have to do for an essay here, 500 words, 10,000 words, 100,000 words. Here, we need to do this on a document that's three billion words, three billion letters, and we need to use something that would be accurate enough to pick out one misspelled letter in that entire genome. So that was kind of the idea in 2012. And at that point, there was a big race to be the first to show that this could work in human cells. So the lab I was in was racing. There were many other labs around the world that were racing. And it took just six months for six different research groups, um, two in Boston, one in Korea, South Korea, the Berkeley group, um, and one, another one in Boston. So essentially, six different groups showed that indeed you could use CRISPR-Cas for genome engineering or RNA-guided human genome engineering. 
So that was done first in human cells growing in a petri dish. And then within just another few months, we had the first, and this I promise looked more normal if I was playing off my computer. But the point is, you know, in just about no time, the first gene edited mouse had been created in the laboratory by putting CRISPR inside of one cell embryos. Then a number of major crops like rice or soybeans, tomatoes, oranges, goats, non-human primates. At this point, kind of any organism that you can work with in a laboratory can be modified with CRISPR because this core technology, once you're inside a cell, it doesn't care what DNA it is. The language of DNA is the same no matter what the organism is. And CRISPR has pretty much worked in every single context. Yeah? Dr. Sternberg, can you kind of take us back maybe to that, to that race? What was it like in your lab as you knew that other firms were bearing down? Was it, were you all just excited? Were you spending like nights in the lab? Were you, did you feel you were so close you just couldn't get that last little, little bit? Of yeah. So my personal story was a little complicating because although I was in doing my PhD in Berkeley, I was actually in New York doing a collaborative project with researchers at Columbia, where I am now as a professor. And I was working on a slightly different question, which was not the gene editing use. So my intersection with gene editing came a little bit later. And of course, looking back with the hindsight I have now, I'd be like, I should have flown back to Berkeley immediately. Um, truthfully, I think in Jennifer's lab, we knew it was big, but it was hard to know how big it is. And I think um, some of the other researchers that published this paper in 2013, they had been working for years on gene editing, but they didn't have scissors. They knew we need a way to make a break in a cell, and if we could just figure out how to do that, then we can basically crack open this new area of biotechnology. And then the June 2012 paper came along, and there was the scissors, and I think I've thought a lot about like um, the different ways that you approach science. You kind of have to have all the right pieces to kind of synthesize information from different places to really innovate new ideas. And I think there were folks on the gene editing side that needed the scissors. There were us, we had the scissors, but maybe didn't have the gene editing background. Um, so I was working my butt off, but on something slightly different, which was still a discovery in the end that was that I think got a lot of attention, but it wasn't on exactly gene editing. I can tell you more recently, my lab at Columbia, we just had our first big paper get published this past June, and that was a huge race, and we were working long days, long nights, and we didn't know it at the time, but our paper ended up coming out the same week as a competing lab from Boston. They published their paper in Science, which is one of the kind of top prestige journals. Ours was in Nature. So we very much felt like we knew that this idea was very new, but probably it had occurred to others. And I think that was kind of the fun part of the project is that competitive feel of needing to get it out quickly, but also really stressful. And I can tell you for sure that there are other people that were working on it that never got it published because our paper came out too soon. So I think that's part of the kind of research um, thrill that can be very motivating at times, but also if you end up on the wrong side of the coin, not as, not as fun. And I should say there's an ongoing major patent dispute over exactly what happened in this 2012 to 2013 timeline. Um, and there's a lot of money in the line for Berkeley and for MIT because the amount of investment that's gone into CRISPR-based technologies has been in the billions. For most people, that's kind of where they heard the CRISPR word, the patent dispute that came out yeah. of yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's kind of unfortunate, but that is the, and I'm, yeah, I, I like to just stay in my little silo of like science and just thinking about the big question, questions in nature, but that is a reality that to translate these new technologies requires investment. Like to make a drug costs about a billion dollars. And for a company to invest a billion dollars, they want to know that they are the only ones that have this kind of privileged idea and technology. So it's a real part of science, yeah. OK, so CRISPRs exploded. Um, in 2009, when I started my PhD, there was like basically nothing known. This is how many papers had CRISPR in their title. 
And now there are like dozens of papers a day using this technology. So I told you that gene editing is not a new idea, but what CRISPR adds to the equation is it's by far the most easiest tool to use for gene editing. It's extremely inexpensive, which means for just 60 bucks, you can pay a company like Agene, a nonprofit company, to send you everything you need to do CRISPR in your lab. So unlike the previous technologies, which might cost thousands or tens of thousands of dollars to adopt, now it's really just a quick Amazon type purchase online and you can be <laughs> getting the materials to do CRISPR at home. There's a do it yourself CRISPR kit that any one of you, not even at a university could buy and do CRISPR experiments in E. coli in your kitchen at home. Um, so, and maybe some of you saw, I don't know if anyone heard about this new documentary on Netflix called Unnatural Selection. Yeah, so that's actually features one of these biohackers that is trying to bring CRISPR to the public. I think there's mostly good with that, but just be skeptical when you watch it because I think there's some stuff coming from those biohackers that's not quite true. But, but I think this is, you know, what CRISPR has changed is that it's so easy to use now that really anyone with a basic understanding of biology can use this tool. Okay, so I'm, we start a little late, so I'm gonna kind of try to hop through now a number of the major sectors where CRISPR is really being used in research and technology. The first one is just basic research. So people that want to understand in whatever model system you might be studying in the lab, what about the DNA or the genome of an organism leads to all the emergent traits and phenotypes? Now we have a way to change DNA in very specific ways and just understand what's affected in the organism. So a couple examples, folks have used CRISPR to understand what genes allow butterflies to have their unique wing coloration patterns. The uh, salamander or axolotl is a popular model organism for studying limb regeneration. Well, I guess we can't regenerate limbs, but they can. But the idea is that if we use CRISPR to understand the pathways that allow these to actually grow new limbs that are amputated, then maybe it'll open up new opportunities for regenerative medicine. CRISPR is being used in this particular fish, which is a very popular model organism for studying aging. And it's also being used to death in uh, cancer biology to really understand what genes or gene mutations cause cancer, or in this case, cause a cancerous cell to become metastatic. So in this case, researchers could modify all the genes in a cancerous cell line put them in a mouse, and then ask the question, which gene mutations allowed that cell to become metastatic? And so these are the kinds of studies that might not themselves be used to treat disease, but they're gonna open up new understandings that will allow the kind of inspire new drug development. Food, just one slide on food. It came up a little bit already. So a lot of major ad companies are very excited about CRISPR. In to some extent because it kind of sidesteps the whole GMO debate. So GMO, as you all know, if you go to the supermarket, there's like a lot of fear spread about GMOs and their potential health effects. So you have products all over the place being labeled GMO free. Well, what about a crop that is gene edited, but it doesn't have any foreign DNA? Is that gonna be considered genetically modified or be considered no differently than something that may have been selectively bred out in a big field. So in Europe, they'll still be labeled GMO. In the US, the USDA actually recently ruled that these kinds of products, which have new properties like fungus resistance or lower neurotoxin levels in this potato, because they don't have foreign DNA, they're not gonna be regulated any differently than a regular food product. That makes some people concerned, but other people think if we can adapt our food to be either healthier or more um, adaptive to changing climate, then we should use whatever tools we need to for that. Um, getting into two kind of slightly more futuristic but real ideas. Um, I don't know if many of you know that there are actually many researchers that feel that pigs could be a new source of organs for organ transplantation in the future. Why pigs? Well, they have a very quick um, maturation time, so they, they mature very quickly, and their organs are roughly the size of human organs. And so now researchers are combining human transgenes and cloning, 
and gene editing to try to humanize pigs so that their organs will be decorated in the kinds of um, cell surface markers that the human body might not reject the way that they do today. So there are real experiments going on. I mean, there's been a lot of research on developing facilities to test this for non-human primates, but this is a, a, a topic that's gotten renewed enthusiasm with the advent of CRISPR. You guys know Jurassic Park? Like, yeah, question. I have a question with the last slide. Yeah. So if that were to happen, would the cost like, be really expensive or inexpensive? Um, I don't know about the cost. I, I think the main reason that's being very aggressively pursued is um, right now, like, there's so many more recipients in need of an organ transplant than there are donors. So I think the idea is that we could address that major inequality with a large kind of unlimited source of organs. The cost is something that came up in the talk this morning, and I think for all of these new therapies, it's going to be a challenge because everything that kind of starts as a new technology probably is not going to be cheap, which means access and insurance coverage and those kinds of issues become really critical. Um, I don't know anything about that healthcare marketplace myself, but it's, I'd say my biggest concern with all these new therapies and especially the kind of controversy over doing editing in embryos, it's not really so much the moral question of should we do this, but more who's going to be doing this. And if it's something that is going to be expensive and then only accessible to wealthy individuals, that's a major problem. And I think that's kind of in, in the science fiction world, that's been played out in a lot of these books is are we going to have now a new kind of inequality that's genetic? with the genetic haves and the haves nots. So I think that's an issue that will need to be figured out. So Jurassic Park, one of my favorite movies growing up, not these like new remakes, Jurassic World. I don't know if, if you guys haven't seen the original, definitely that's the best one. <laughs> um, anyone know why Jurassic Park could never really happen in real life? Oxygen, what does someone say? We're all gonna die if dinosaurs come back? <laughs> <laughs> There's like a physical reason. I don't, oxygen might be involved, but I'm thinking of something about DNA itself. Yeah, Right, because the DNA has a half-life of about 10,000 years, which means 65 million years ago, that's way too far ago for there to be any intact DNA that you can still sequence. People have sequenced collagen, collagen protein, so protein sequencing from intact dinosaur fossils, but definitely DNA is long gone. But that is not the case with the woolly mammoth. So this beast went extinct only 3,000 years ago, and they've been beautifully preserved in the permafrost, so people are trying to actually resurrect woolly mammoths in two main different ways. One is, can we find cells that could still be alive in these preserved specimens, or can we take the genetics approach? So actually a couple years ago there was a paper that sequenced the complete genome of the woolly mammoth and they sequenced the com complete genome of the Asian elephant and they both share a common ancestor. So the idea is, well, maybe we can take Asian elephant cells, grow them in the laboratory, and then use CRISPR to introduce mutations to convert some of the Asian elephant genes into their woolly mammoth counterparts. And there's literally like a list that these guys at Harvard have put together of what would be all the mutations that you might need to make to now have a genome that could approximate the kinds of phenotypes you might think about with the mammoth, like having hair, long hair across the body, or more thermal tolerance, or more fat content. Now, could you actually have a woolly mammoth get born? That would involve doing IVF in elephants, which has never been done before, and like would something like that really be a woolly mammoth or would it be more of an elephant hybrid? I think it's still science fiction, but the point is now with gene editing, anytime you have a sequence of interest, whether it's a healthy version of a gene or a gene that once existed on Earth but has long gone extinct, you could now in theory bring this back to Earth. Okay, and then I think what 99.9% .9 of researchers working on CRISPR technology would like to do is realize this dream of treating and maybe curing genetic diseases, not by taking drugs for the rest of a patient's lifetime, 
But going into the genome at the site of the mutation and just flipping out that T for an A. So where are we at with this venture? So these papers are just some of the hundreds of papers that have now basically pulled this off in a petri dish. So with cells growing in a laboratory, taking either stem cells from a patient or making a model of a disease, it's now become pretty commonplace to use CRISPR to completely eliminate those mutations. So a couple examples, this was a repair of the gene that when mutated causes cystic fibrosis, correcting, correction of the sickle cell mutation. This was a mutation that causes blindness, hemophilia, fragile X syndrome. So at this point in a cell, the molecular capabilities are basically there with some caveats, but they're basically there to pull this off. The real challenge now, and where I think many of the clinical trials are going to have the biggest problem, is really delivering these kinds of molecules into patients. Because of course, we, our whole body is evolved to, to ward off foreign agents, either pathogens like bacteria or viruses or foreign DNA that might be freely circulating. So we need to figure out a way that if we had a patient who has a disease we want to treat, how can we deliver CRISPR either systemically into the body or maybe think about ways of treating cells outside of the body ex vivo where you might take a blood draw, edit blood cells outside of the patient's body and then only transplant those corrected cells back into the patient. So clinical trials have kind of really just begun in the last couple of years so I think it's really too early to say is this dream going to be realized? But I think there are some really promising signs. So one of them, I think, was a story from 2015 that I think is really remarkable. This was a one-year-old patient in the UK um, who was dying from leukemia, which is a blood cancer. She happened to be in the same hospital where there were already researchers developing something called cancer immunotherapy, which is using genetically engineered T cells to treat cancer. And they were combining a certain type of engineering with gene editing. And so because she was basically on her deathbed, they were approved to use this um, experimental treatment on a compassionate use basis. She received the cells and it basically sent her cancer completely into remission. So I think the dream is that this kind of example, which was before any clinical trials had even begun, is something that'll be more and more common I think blood cancers are among the easiest to go after because you can introduce engineered cells into the bloodstream where they circulate. But solid tumors, I think, are, are kind of the next frontier. But this is really the dream that these types of stories are now going to become more and more frequent in the coming years. Um, yes? What you were just talking about, instead of giving somebody a drug for the rest of their life, is this person going to have to get transfusions for the rest of their life? So that's a good question. So in the case of that patient, she received an allogeneic infusion, which is cells from a different patient, which would require her to probably take um, immunosuppressive drugs for the rest of her life because to avoid host versus graft disease. But the real dream would be not taking a, another person's cells, but actually my own cells. So in her case, she was too sick to donate enough T cells. She didn't have enough of her own T cells to be engineered. But if you could have used her own cells, then you essentially endow them with this new capability to find the cancer cells in the body, but they're actually her own cells, so you don't have to worry about immunosuppressive regimens. Or could you take those allogeneic cells, but edit them in a way that they wouldn't recognize the patient's cells as foreign, or vice versa? So now there's a lot of work being done to kind of figure out ways to cloak cells from a donor so that they, you wouldn't even have to worry about host versus graft disease. I think that's still a little bit in the future, but cancer immunotherapy combined with gene editing is one of the most aggressive areas of development right now for, for human therapeutics. And it was also awarded the Nobel Prize two years ago. Okay, I'm going to skip this and get to... Um, kind of what I think has put CRISPR in the news most recently. And I, and I do want to stress that this is not, there are very, very few researchers that are actually actively pursuing these kinds of applications, but there are greater than zero. And I think 
because this is such a profound idea that we might start choosing what gene edits a future child might have, it deserves specific mention. So one quick term that you should walk away understanding a little bit about is this term, the germline, which is often the more technical term for doing editing earlier in human development, potentially as early as the one cell uh, embryo. So why is it called the germline? Well, germ cells are cells like eggs, sperm, embryonic stem cells that are involved in reproduction. So they can directly transmit genetic information from one generation to the next. And so that led to this idea of the germline, this line of germ cells that bridge generations, as opposed to somatic cells, which are just um, body cells like blood cells, muscle cells, nerve cells, which might cause a disease in my body. And if I edit those cells, maybe I could have a therapeutic uh, improvement, but none of those edits would be transmitted to my children because they're not in my germ cells. Whereas if you make a change in an embryo, it's not only gonna affect this resulting infant and adult, but all of the adult's germ cells will still have the same edits, which means as soon as this adult procreates, the next generation inherits all those same edits. And so that's why many have viewed germline modifications as this red line, because it's the first time that you're talking about introducing a modification that will essentially now forever be present in that lineage of humans. So a number of years ago, I was part of a group of authors that kind of published a white paper that was really had the goal of alerting the community to this new possibility, not because we thought it should be done or shouldn't be done, but just it's probably possible now. And rather than have the work happening behind closed doors or have it proceed secretly, we thought that the broader community and not just scientists, but members of the public should be made aware that this is now an idea that will probably become possible with this new form of precision gene editing. The White House put out a statement around the same time about germline gene editing, as did the National Institutes of Health and even the US intelligence community. So there was a lot of awareness that this is possible. Um, but I think it's kind of part of human nature that you're gonna find someone that goes and does it anyway, even if everyone else is saying, let's proceed cautiously and not jump to the gun. And that first paper came from uh, China, where in 2015, they were the first to do gene editing in human zygotes. These are fertilized eggs. There was a lot of backlash in the news, but then it was just a matter of time before the next paper came along. This was a, a big paper that got a lot of publicity from University of Oregon. And then we finally get to 2018 when for the first time someone did this clinically, which means not just in a laboratory for research purposes, but actually putting the embryo in a surrogate mother and that embryo leading to the birth of two twins. So I think this, and uh, this was a very dramatic event because it actually was announced, it was kind of scooped by the AP the night before the second international summit on human genome editing. And this meeting was um, convened to basically discuss, should we do this and go into all the deep ethical regulatory safety concerns. And then the night before the meeting started, there was a huge uh, news story that, that broke that it had already been done. And then the next day, this guy for the first time presented the data on this new experiment. So um, what did he do? He wanted to endow these two baby girls with a gene mutation that confers HIV resistance. We don't know anything from publications, so it was just what he presented in that conference. I think, you know, although HIV resistance falls right on that threshold of, it kind of feels like maybe it's okay because it's preventing a disease, but it's also not preventing an unavoidable disease. It's not that these babies were going to get HIV infection. It was basically giving them a new mutation so that they would never even be able to be infected, which many could see as kind of an enhancement. And that's often the distinction that's drawn is, well, we can think about treating and curing disease, but the minute that crosses over into human enhancement, now we've really fundamentally changed the way we're thinking about how to use genetics and genetic engineering. But beyond that, um, 
the way he did the experiments, I can tell you, was very unethical in that the, the, the science was not done properly. Um, there were major concerns over the, whether the parents were really given proper um, information on what was being done. And then I think the worst part is that he did all this in secret and then kind of at the last minute announced this to the world, hoping that people were going to somehow congratulate him. But in fact, it was widely condemned. And now I think the whole intensity of this conversation has been renewed over the last year. So just a couple like news updates if you're interested. So as I said, the work's been condemned and he got fired right away. And there's now kind of, it's actually unknown where he is and what happened to him. But uh, at some point there was a New York Times article that there were guards stationed at an unmarked hotel room and he was not able to leave. So I think it's unclear what's happening in China. Um, two US scientists were actually implicated in either being aware of or aiding in this experiment. And so I think it has kind of brought new attention to the importance for scientists or non-scientists to really be more transparent about this. And I think it's one of the worst outcomes for people to act in secrecy because that's the best way to, to scare the public or to make people think that crazy things are happening behind closed doors. Um, I think there is kind of, things are moving in the right direction in that there's been now the announcement of a moratorium on really not doing this until further discussions are had. The World Health Organization has kind of proposed uh, a new global registry where all CRISPR experiments in humans would be registered and reviewed by an international panel. So I think there's reason to be optimistic, but there are still major kind of concerns over how we should move forward. So um, I'm going to skip this a little bit, except to say that I think there's still exciting science happening. And as someone that doesn't do any work with human embryos, I'm very, very, very far away from that world. I like to study CRISPR biology and really think about how we can use nature to still inspire new tools. This is kind of just a, a little tree of life for what CRISPR looks like in bacteria. This is, of course, Darwin's famous drawing of the tree of life. And this is what it looks like for CRISPR. So bacteria have many different versions of CRISPR, different tools, many of which are going to be useful for different kinds of applications. So that's something that we're working on in my lab. And I think what's exciting is that it's not just gene editing, but we can do so many different manipulations now, which I think are furthering basic research, but also giving us new opportunities for, for thinking about how to treat disease. So I do think that's one take home from this entire discovery is that basic curiosity is something we still need to fund and to, to pursue in the laboratory because certainly no one studying bacteria and these viruses thought that there was going to be a major discovery there until there was. And I think you still need to go and study those interesting pathways, not because they're useful, but because they're interesting. CRISPR has really democratized gene editing. So I think now it is a tool that for doing research, anyone can access um, at home or in the laboratory. Um, the pathway to making this kind of dream of CRISPR-based therapies a reality is not going to be fast, but I think we're right at this breaking point of, of where we might see new cures coming on the market in the next couple of years. And then I think there are, we, there is this need to continue discussing all of these different applications and what are really the most responsible uses for this technology. Um, and with that, this is uh, what Jennifer Doudna looks like. So I know she was the number one person. I'm sorry that she couldn't come, but hopefully I'm an acceptable replacement. She, she's, she's, she's a, a B now. You're A. Um, okay. <laughs> um, this is, uh, so I did my PhD in Berkeley. I loved living in the Bay Area. I love California, but now I'm in this kind of crazy place. So we're in this building right here, this red brick building in northern Manhattan, right by the George Washington Bridge, which goes over to New Jersey. Um, I have loved kind of getting my lab up and running over the last couple of years and have some fantastic undergrads and grad students working in the lab. Um, so if you're ever in New York and want to come and see what the lab looks like or talk more CRISPR, you're always welcome. And I'll be happy to take some questions if there are any. Thank you. questions and then for those of you I know several of you may have like a book or anything like that he'll be uh, up here he'd be happy to, to autograph books or if you want to 
uh, ask a, a little, uh, real quick question. So. And sorry, I went kind of long, but so if people need to leave, go and just walk out. kind of say, hey, look, we're putting the brakes on it, when all the while they're probably not, and they're they're continuing ahead because of, uh, you know, governments are interested in it more so than they let on to be. I do think there's probably an element of that. Um, so I was in one of the first ethics meetings in 2015, and I remember very vividly, there was a prominent person in the room that made a comment about, um, that was roughly along the lines of, of course this is gonna happen, but we need to make sure that we go about this in the right way. So I, I, I do think, unfortunately, there are probably more people, not more people, there are some people that don't feel we should put the brakes on, but are worried about the public backlash if it's not done in the right way. Um, I can't, I don't know enough about what the public sentiment is, but I do think there's part, what's the way to, to interface with the public? And then there is, I think, real apprehension about the science, because right now there are still some issues with gene editing that need to be worked out. And there's a real, and for me, it's really the question about investment and what's the right use of our resources. And you know, even with IVF right now, which would go hand in hand with uses in the embryo, that's something that's usually not covered by insurance. It costs like ten dollars to $20,000. So that's only accessible to a very small slice of society. So I see real problems with a new type of technology that's going to not only allow you to pick a good embryo, but make changes in the embryo. That's going to go hand in hand with these kind of elitist or kind of expensive um, products that only some people can buy. Is there a question in the back? More Serve as organ donors. Uh, yep. Services. You said that it's going to humanize the pigs in order to be able to transplant into humans. Now, would that still require humans to take the immunosuppressants the rest of their life? Almost certainly. Just but because it's I think you can only humanize. Yeah, and this is well outside of my expertise, but I, I think it would be a huge success if that ever works, even with immunosuppressive drugs. I mean, already now with a, a, a transplant from another human, generally you have to take drugs to suppress an immune response for the rest of your lifetime. So I think we would be in a good place if it works, period, even if you have to take, because I think in the end, you're going to die if you don't get the transplant. So even if taking those immunosuppressive drugs the rest of your life is, you know, makes your life a little bit more difficult, at least you're still alive, I guess. Yeah. But my immediate concern is, um, can you make super viruses as a weapon using this technology? Can you repeat the question? So could you make super viruses a weapon using this technology? So there is one part of CRISPR that I didn't really talk about called gene drive, which I might have a slide here somewhere, this one. I'm not going to go to the details, but just remember the word gene drive because this is actually a, a, a use of CRISPR that I think is one of the most concerning because essentially it can spread traits into wild populations with super Mendelian inheritance. So why would you want to do that? Well, right now the mosquito is a major vector for diseases like uh, dengue virus and um, malaria. And so there's the idea, could you actually genetically modify mosquitoes? release them into the wild and have those released animals spread malaria resistance traits. Now that would be a great thing because something like 700,000 people die from malaria every year. But this is something that could conceivably we be weaponized. Um, so there's actually, I'd say the germline embryo stuff has got most of the attention. This is something that I think could be much more destructive if it were in the wrong hands. Um, it wouldn't be easy to do that, but I think conceptually it'd be possible. So the National Academies and the U.S. intelligence community has also been studying this, and they have a very long report that they published last year on gene drives. 
I don't want you to all to leave thinking that there's like only gloom and doom with CRISPR, but there are some concerns, and I think they are being looked at very carefully. And I'd say this is one with, with the gene drives. Yeah. Yeah. What would be the, so say somebody uh, modifies their genes to pass it on to their family, and they're, you know, they, they can cure cancer in their life and their you know, family lineage. But what would be the, the issue, or is there an issue with them being more susceptible to other types of uh, foreign invasion in their bodies? Yeah, so you asked about, um, edits that might kind of uh, protect you from cancer or treat cancer, but would there be other maybe unintended consequences from those edits? And I think that's certainly one of, one of the many concerns with making heritable changes. Do we really understand the genome well enough to appreciate all of the consequences of something that might seem like a good thing, but maybe it has other effects? So one popular example, which I think we wrote about in the book, is sickle cell. So why is sickle cell actually such a prevalent um, disease? Well, it's because having one copy of the sickle mutation actually leads to resistance to malaria. So that's probably why that mutation spread in the human population. So let's say in a hypothetical future, you completely eradicate the humans on Earth, but now a particularly destructive uh, plasmodium parasite emerges that cannot be targeted with any other therapy, and now we basically lost our natural protection against malaria. I don't know if, the, maybe that's not the best example, but it's one example of kind of these pleiotropic or multiple effects of a given mutation. It might be harmful for one thing, but have a protective uh, function for another thing, and I think it's something that we need to really make sure we understand completely before saying, Oh, like, let's go and edit this gene because X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Uh, you talked a little bit about some of the competition with between different labs working on this. And I know this week on NPR they talked about Prime Editor, yeah. which apparently would be something competitive with this. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And it's very cool, by the way, that these new discoveries are now on, like, NPR because I don't know. It's just cool to see research that you're aware of or working on in the public news. So I actually saw the senior author present that twice in just the last two weeks, including earlier this week. So this is a new version of CRISPR technology. I think some of the news stories presented it as like different than CRISPR. It's kind of a derivative of CRISPR, but it's a new way to control how the editing is done. And I kind of oversimplify the way that gene editing works in a way. But essentially, on that cartoon where you had the molecular scissors cutting, and then separately there was a little red DNA, that's the replacement template. Prime editing, this new technology that was just published this week, combines those into one step. So that rather than um, cutting first and then pasting in a new sequence, which is actually much more difficult than I made it seem, now you kind of, the cutter itself is also putting in the new sequence. So it takes one of the major bottlenecks of gene editing out the door because now you don't need the cell to do repairing. The CRISPR molecule you put in is doing the repair itself. So I think that this new technology will be a complete game changer actually. I think that's a big deal. Yeah. Is there any evidence of viruses um having like an immunity against CRISPR? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Did you already know the answer? No. Yeah. I'm curious. You're absolutely spot on. So that's one really cool thing about this, the evolutionary backstory to CRISPR in bacteria. Like why do bacteria still exist if there's 10 times more viruses than bacteria? Or why do viruses still exist if CRISPR have all the, or if bacteria have all these immune systems? And kind of they're in this co-evolutionary struggle. And one thing that's resulted, the reason that there's that kind of crazy tree of CRISPR systems that exist is because the viruses have caused bacteria to diversify and evolve new versions of CRISPR. And CRISPR has caused the evolution of what are called anti-CRISPRs, which are virally encoded inhibitors that viruses evolve that basically lock up or jam up the CRISPR machine so that it can't work anymore. 
So there's a very cool story of how each side of this kind of evolutionary struggle keeps on innovating new ways to counteract the other, and then that leads to evasion of that, and it goes back and forth, and so that's part of why this is such a fun system to study, because there's so many different layers to it, and the deeper you look, you find yet more molecular strategies that one of them is used to kind of figure out how to win that, that war. So um, that poses kind of another question. Um, when we start incorporating CRISPR, do you think it'll be kind of like what we do with vaccines now? Because of that, like, co-evolution? Um, so I'm trying to think how to answer that question. So um, do you mean could we use CRISPR to vaccinate ourselves against disease? Yes, and if viruses are, you know, there's already evidence that they have immunity against CRISPR, like will that force us to keep finding new CRISPRs? So yeah, that actually brings up a really great thing, which I didn't mention, which is, um, which is related to what you said. So we actually, this is a new discovery. Humans, in some cases, already have immunity to CRISPR because CRISPR comes from bacteria and they actually come from bacteria that humans are exposed to. So many humans already have pre-existing immunity to CRISPR proteins. So there's been a need to find CRISPR tools for gene editing that come from bacteria that humans haven't seen before so that you don't basically use the very proteins that our body has already encountered before and figured out ways to target with an immune response. So that's one. And then maybe a little bit related to the question of um, kind of ways to stop CRISPR, gene drive, one of the main ways that people think we could avoid weaponization is to use these naturally occurring inhibitors of CRISPR. Imagine now you had a reversal drive where you take one of those virally encoded inhibitors you put it on a different mosquito, and now that would basically stop this one from spreading. That's still a little bit kind of in fantasy world, but that's a way that people are, th are thinking about using this natural diversity in all of these different defensive and offensive measures to kind of counteract against some of these risks. Thank you. That's a really good question. We'll take one more question. Yeah. as Cybernetic enhancement. Well, I would say I don't, me personally, I don't view, let me think. I mean, I don't know if I'm morally opposed to enhancement in a hypothetical world where it could be available to everyone. So like using glasses is an enhancement. There are people that do not see as well as others, and we are very happy enhancing their vision by making a, a robot or a, an apparatus that can improve that. Education is an enhancement. Um, LASIK surgery is an enhancement. Cosmetic surgery is a highly elective procedure that enhances a quality that is not really medically necessary. But I think probably many people feel like if it's your own body and you want to pay for something to make you feel better about your body, who am I to stop you? Or who's the government to stop you? So I think that's, like these are all, I, I know those are very far away from cybernetic or genetic enhancements, but um, what am I, I'm kind of rambling a little bit. I guess, so I'm not personally opposed to any kind of enhancement if, if it's accessible and it's not gonna uh, adversely impact society in a way that leads to more inequality. I guess that'd be my personal hand wavy answer, but we could maybe talk more, or anyone else have a comment on that? I don't know. Think about prosthetics. Yeah, prosthetics too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've seen some things at the airport. Lady had a, an arm that was looked completely you know, modified, uh, carbon fiber uh, servos, gave her the articulation, improved her well-being. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think there are difficult topics, and I think the problem is that access goes hand in hand with a lot of these things, and that's what I struggle the most with. But it's kind of like amazing that we could think about making ourselves better in some ways or, or having better lives, and I think 
it's about finding the right balance to do that in a responsible way, I guess. So for those of you who are science majors, you take your chemistry, you take your math, you take your bio, you take all these science classes, and right, you, there's a right answer, right? You got black or white, right? So two plus two equals, boom. Hopefully you realize now in the sciences, there are correct answers, but then out in the real world, world there's a lot of gray. There's a lot of gray. So, um, and I would say, and I would say as scientists or whatever you do, even though I'm not an ethicist, I have no credentials to speak about any of this, but you don't, but I think it's okay. And we actually should engage in not just what we do in the lab or in the classroom, but how it affects society. That's actually what this building is. It's cool. About, it's about, it's about, the, the, about the, the, the arts, the humanities, and the sciences, so it's, it's perfect. Um, Dr. Sternberg will actually be speaking one more time uh, this evening over at Forum 101. It'll be a, a, a similar talk, uh, but may have been, of course, the question answer is usually a little bit different. So if, if you enjoyed yourself or you want to bone up on a little bit more CRISPR, you're more than welcome to, to speak or to, to listen one more time. So one more time, let's hear for Dr. Sternberg. Welcome to have a wonderful, uh, wonderful day. <laughs> that too. Thank you very much for coming. Really Thank enjoyed. you. Yeah.